Okay, so next we'll move to a later stage of Sir Colin's life when he worked for many years at Smith Klein Beecham, later to become uh, GlaxoSmithKline. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome um, uh, Dr. Pauline Williams, CBE, who's a senior vice uh, president at GSK, to talk about uh, the le legacy of Sir Colin, uh, uh, Sir Colin's role at, uh, at GSK. Thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here for the BPS 90th anniversary and also to play a small role in this tribute to Sir Colin. Um, so Sir Colin um, played a pivotal role as a consultant uh, to SB and then GSK over 20 years. And um, here are just a, a smorgasbord of the uh, governance committees and uh, councils and boards that uh, Sir Colin uh, played a, a key role in, in being a, a core member. Um, there are a couple that I want to, to point out. One is at uh, as advisor to the chair of R&D, um, Tashi Mada and uh, Patrick Valance um, taking that position. Um, also, um, the Product Investment Board is uh, a key committee that looks at investment of the entire portfolio of um, GSK's uh, products. Uh, both in development and marketed, and the Global Safety Board, which uh, is a key medical governance board. He was also a very keen member of the Chemistry Council, and I think was a frustrated chemist, and, uh, and certainly um, could, could really hold his own in conversations with uh, my chemist colleagues, as well as being uh, a founding member of the clinical pharmacology and discovery medicine community. So in a word cloud that um, I pulled together from descriptors from uh, colleagues past and present in preparing for this, um, you'll see that encyclopedic uh, was, was probably the, the most common descriptor. Um, diligent, forensic, hardworking, passionate, patient-focused, and terrifying. <laughs> but similarly, um, in talking to um, his admin, um, Helen Budd, she paints another picture of Sir Colin, which some of us were privileged to see in terms of very kind, thoughtful, often quite shy gentleman, very driven, dedicated, and also a wicked sense of humour that some of us were lucky to see. And I was also amused, and actually Sir Keith Peters pointed me in the direction of, of uh, uh, Sir Colin's own description, where he describes his recreations in, double, in Who's Who um, as being travel, amateur radio, and work on new targets for medicines, uh, which uh, most of us are handsomely paid for. In uh, researching this talk, I went back to uh, a seminal paper by Sir Colin, Lost in Translation, um, in the British Journal of Pharmacology. And if you haven't read this, I really do recommend that you do, because actually... It, it talks through the history of translational medicine and um, includes some really important messages that, that I've highlighted and, and uh, pulled out in quotes. The first of which is that translational medicine is a roller coaster. But Sir Colin was wise enough to know that it so often needs a leap of faith. And if you're in governance committees and you say no to everything progressing, you'll be right 99% of the time. And it's that 1% where you take that leap of faith that means that we can get medicines to patients. And in terms of um, the attrition, uh, this is just one uh, uh, analysis that was published in Drug Discovery Today um, that looks at the, the different uh, reasons for attrition as you go through that uh, discovery pipeline from preclinical through to phase three. And I want to perhaps draw on uh, something that June Rain said earlier, which is if you get the science right, then the regulation will follow, as will the commercial success. And so it was on the pharmacokinetics, the bioavailability, the clinical safety, the toxicology and efficacy, and uh, indeed technical aspects that Sir Colin uh, really focused. And although uh, we talk about him as being a clinical pharmacologist, I think he really developed a huge depth of expertise that he was able to then influence project teams across uh, the different disciplines. 
And again, a quote from Lost in Translation, that translational medicine begins with the choice of target, not with first time in human. I think we sometimes tend to think that clinical pharmacology, experimental medicine, um, is, is all focused on that first in human to proof of concept um, uh, stage. But in fact, uh, the secret to that success starts much, much earlier. And so Colin was very involved with all of the stages from target selection and validation um, through to the medicinal chemistry and the design of the, the molecules and a big focus on drug distribution. <laughs> So starting with target validation, it's, <laughs> it's really hard to do justice to um, uh, the work that Sir Colin did. So I'm just scratching the surface and pulling out a few examples of where he was particularly passionate. And target validation, I think, was one of these. And just some work that was done by uh, GSK colleagues, um, uh, Matt Nelson working with Long Carden at the time, who was head of, of genetics, really um, pointing to the fact that if you have um, human genetic validation of your target, then that approximately doubles your, um, your chances of having success um, with a, a, a marketed drug or an approved drug, I should say. Whether it's uh, successful and marketed depends on your commercial colleagues. Um, but I think this um, heralded a really exciting time, not just for GSK, but across the pharmaceutical industry in terms of collaboration, really to unleash the potential of, of genetics and, and functional genomics. And indeed, uh, Rab Prinja, uh, one of my GSK colleagues, said that one of the most animated uh, times that he'd seen uh, Sir Colin really excited in his seat was when John Stam came uh, from the Altius Institute to Stevenage to, to talk about um, the work. Oh, sorry, there's also another quote here that I think is incredibly important. Choosing targets needs integrated thinking across a range of disciplines. And I think this is something that Sir Colin was really keen to do, was to bring all of the different experts um, to the table to, to really look at um, a problem. Now, I've tried to faithfully recreate a mouse mat uh, that Sir Colin describes, and I haven't seen it in real life, um, but uh, I've done it in corporate uh, GSK Orange um, that says, you can make it, can we develop it? Uh, with a picture of uh, red brick dust in the middle. And, and this is really true in terms of uh, thinking about developability of, of a molecule, particularly an oral small molecule. Um, and uh, Sir Colin, used every opportunity to quote Lipinski's rules um, in terms of uh, what uh, attributes uh, a, a chemical needed if it was going to, to really have the appropriate um, developability uh, attributes. And GSK, um, as well as AstraZeneca and Pfizer, and no doubt every other pharmaceutical company have got a different version of, of their uh, developability principles. Uh, Pfizer have the three pillars of survival, uh, AstraZeneca the five R's, GSK question-based assessment, and all of these have now evolved into really quite sophisticated um, visualizations of, of the attributes of uh, medicines to essentially say, do you have the right target? Do you have the, the right tissue, the right safety, the right patients, and the right clinical plan to, to demonstrate that? And this is, all seems to be pretty obvious, but actually it's surprising how many times you get it wrong. And each of these uh, companies has done its own analysis and published in terms of uh, when you have taken a leap of faith where some of these things have not been uh, really achieved and perhaps have been driven more by the champion and belief rather than being truly objective um, that then lead to late stage attrition. And I think it's that objectivity and that challenge that Sir Colin really brought to the table. One of the uh, key areas that uh, Sir Colin was interested in, we heard about the VQ scans, um, was imaging. And uh, I had a, a fun conversation with Professor Paul Matthews recently, who said that when GSK was tendering uh, for an imaging centre, and it was Oxford versus Hammersmith, and he saw that Sir Colin was uh, on the, uh, the committee, he pretty knew what the answer was going to be. And so this is a picture of the uh, clinical imaging centre at Hammersmith in the dark, which is probably the best time to see it, maybe. Um, but uh, this was uh, established really to um, 
bring out the, the, the potential of, of imaging that was beginning to uh, emerge in, in drug discovery and development and, and really the utility around those those questions around uh, does my compound get to where I want it uh, does my compound bind to the target does it exhibit the right pharmacology and is it efficacious in disease relevant endpoints and uh, one example this um, is, is just a, a generic anonymized uh, pet receptor occupancy study but I remember uh, very early on in the mid 2000s I was involved with an NK1 antagonist where uh, preclinically we'd anticipated that the uh, therapeutic dose would be about 100 milligrams and when we did the displacement uh, PET uh, receptor occupancy study we, we were seeing full uh, uh, receptor occupancy at less than one milligram so this was a real wake-up call and uh, uh, Mabel I will introduce later but I believe uh, Diana unfortunately was the other lady in this <laughs> Colin's life um, also, uh, Paul did say somewhat ruefully that perhaps uh, Sir Colin preferred PET over functional MRI, but uh, equally uh, he does acknowledge uh, its, its utility. And this is just one example that I was involved in um, in GSK, uh, where we were looking at um, the uh, uh, ability to differentiate between depressed and healthy subjects um, in response to sad faces um, with depressed subjects having a more exaggerated response to sad faces that was then attenuated uh, with treatment in this case it was fluoxetine and we were looking to see if we could um, see if, uh, those neural correlates actually could predict uh, res response uh, painfully reminded by this, uh, this publication that I was then subsequently dumped by a neuroscientist who said that I was failing to activate his anterior cingulate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but fast forward to Sir Colin at the age of 84, and this was uh, really where he was absolutely thrilled to be at the launch of the new 3D nanosims instrument at the National Physical Laboratory. Um, somewhat lacking in gender equality in this picture, but uh, nevertheless, I think, uh, just um, perhaps fulfills one of uh, Colin's lifelong passions, which was to really look at uh, drug distribution at, at a cellular level. I think it's also worth pointing out that Sir Colin was a huge champion for industry academic collaborations and also bi-directional movement between academia and industry. And here I've just pulled out a few of my esteemed colleagues, Paul Matthews, Duncan Richards, Caroline Savage, Ed Bullmore and, uh, and Patrick, um, all of whom have, uh, have um, come from academia and, and gone back into successful careers although I'm not sure <laughs> Patrick uh, might regret that. <laughs> um, but uh, in my one and only um, publication with, with Sir Colin, we talked mm -hmm. about uh, the future being much closer collaboration between the pharmaceutical industry and, and academia. And I think we've heard throughout the course of today how important that has been uh, for the benefit of patients. But to also to point out that... Um, there needs to be some change on both sides, that industry has got much more to do to build trust, uh, developing a culture of openness and greater freedom to publish, and academia um, in terms of academics, um, setting aside some prejudices, for example. Another quote from Sir Colin was the importance um, of end-to-end -end thinking from the very start and to define translational medicine from basic science to maintenance of good health. And that translational medicine doesn't end until many years later when both physicians and patients have understood how to use it safely and effectively in the real world. So while we think about the valley of death being that critical point between discovery and clinical proof of concept, you really haven't achieved that until you have, have seen this medicine in real world use. And to that end, Sir Colin was a really core cool member of the Global Safety Board, um, looking at the, the benefit risk of, of, of GSK medicines throughout their life course. And he felt very strongly as a clinician scientist that those who care most about discovering and testing new drugs 
are the patients who need them. And so he really made sure that it was the voice of the patient was brought into the room whenever we were making critical progression uh, decisions. He also brought in the, the voice of Google because having sat next to him in this committee over many years, was astonished at how quickly he could be checking facts in real time and challenging um, the, the presenters. And uh, also the wicked sense of humour, often by our sides, um, when the mute button was on on a video conference, when project team said, there are no data indicating a problem. And so Colin said, might there be a comma missing from that sentence? <laughs> Uh, we've talked about his work in hypertension, and certainly he recognised the white cone syndrome of, of blood pressure going up when you see a physician walking towards you, and I think that was true for project teams when they saw Sir Colin uh, take the mic. And... Um, he was also a member of the Medicines for Malaria Ventures Global Safety Board, which really mimicked the model of what we had in GSK. And, and I thought this was a lovely quote from their chief medical officer, uh, Stefan Duparc, who said he was a walking medical encyclopedia. But when, Colin, when a project had been reviewed by Sir Colin, we knew it was in extremely good hands. So... As I've said, Sir Colin joined his own experience as a, as a clinical investigator, and I've just pulled out a few points that, that were real kind of bugbears and, and uh, things that Sir Colin felt very strongly about, in, including full exploration of the dose response curve, the importance of hands on investigator experience. If you're designing a protocol, you really need to understand what does it mean for the patient, what does it mean for the investigator. Detailed follow up of serious adverse events, and again in Lost in Translation, he says, take careful note of the patient's symptoms. They are telling you the pharmacology. And um, N equals one, well, we've talked about some of the experiments that perhaps he did on his own forearm, um, but also was a challenge to say, how can you test this hypothesis in, in, in one patient? I've, uh, I've got a, a, an image here of um, a pile of documents, and this is to remind me that uh, not only did this uh, somewhat resemble Sir Colin's desk, uh, but also that he talked fondly about the days where perhaps a protocol was just two sides of A4 um, and a consent form was perhaps just, just a sentence or two. And indeed, I, I certainly bore the wrath of Sir Colin one time when, uh, um, with a medical student, we did a project looking at readability of consent forms and the readability age that you should target is around 12, which is the equivalent to the average reader of the Sun newspaper. And Sir Colin did not think that was an appropriate conclusion to that paper. Um, we've heard about the Northwick Park incident, so I won't go into to depth about this, other than to say that Sir Colin, um, both internally in GSK and as, as a co-chair of the ABPI BIA committee uh, contributing to the Duff report, um, really looked closely at what we could learn from this tragedy and how we could um, uh, really change best practice in, in first time in human. And uh, the, the Mabel I, I talked about before, the minimal mm -hmm. anticipated biological effect level really being as as, if not more important, than the no observable adverse effect level um, in preclinical studies. He also played a role, I think, um, I can't see, but Oscar de, de la Pasqua was here earlier, um, uh, looking at how we could really make um, integrated uh, non-clinical safety assessment visualisations so it could be really, really clear as we moved from animals to man. Also, the impo importance of hospital-based first-time-in-human studies, sentinel dosing, so that you're not dosing all the subjects all at once. Um, and he was a great advocate for the physician who knows most about the drug to be actually on site for that first dose. Similarly, and I think it's really important to put a balance here because uh, we can overload things with bureaucracy, but Sir Colin was a real advocate to keep things as simple as possible because he recognised that the more bureaucracy we put in, the longer we're delaying an important medicine reaching patients. Behind the stern facade, um, there was a good sense of humour. And uh, I recall fondly a, an R&D uh, fun day that, that we had, uh, that uh, we had a mock the week scenes we'd like to see session with unlikely things to hear Sir Colin say. And, and I'll let you, you read those. Um, but um, 
One of the things that I'll point out was the, uh, the travelling. His love of travel was uh, legendary. And, and I think um, Helen and Caroline, his, his job share admins, uh, certainly had to build very, very complex uh, itineraries uh, for Sir Colin. And uh, one anecdote from John Lepore, who heads up research in, in GSK, said that there was a time when they were in the British Airways lounge uh, in Philadelphia, ready to come back to London. And the captain came in to apologise that there was a a delay because of uh, a problem with the uh, uh, plane radio, at which point Sir Colin jumped up and uh, collared the, uh, the captain and, and, and offered his assistance to mend it. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a, a picture of Sir Colin's retirement from GSK, uh, presented uh, by, by Patrick, which was a celebration of his uh, 20 years as a senior consultant to the chair of R&D. Um, also coincided with a farewell to Sir Keith Peters uh, uh, too, who's hoping to be here today and is, is hopefully watching on online on the live stream. Um, but what is the legacy? Well, I think... Uh, Unfortunately, Sir Colin never met Hal Barron, who's our now uh, chair and president of, of R&D. But I think they would have got on famously because there's so many principles in terms of culture now that's embedded about being ambitious for patients, following the science, embracing the power and technology of, of, of technology and big data, and also outstanding cross-disciplinary talent. Um, so with that, I, I will close, but just want to say a uh, heartfelt thank you to, to Sir Colin for everything that he did for GSK and, and uh, his legacy lives on. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, Pauline, for that fantastic talk. Uh, it's clear he had a very uh, strong and long-lasting legacy at GSK, so thank you. Um, can I open up the floor for, to, for questions? Maybe I'll start then. So um, we've heard, obviously, he's had a long career in industry, and you've talked very briefly about sort of the barrier between clinical work and, an uh, and industry and how things maybe need to change to sort of improve that. And I wondered whether you might expand on some of what we need to do to sort of try and bridge that gap. Yeah, I, I mean, I will say that I think it uh, has moved on in leaps and bounds. Uh, I mean, I, th I think we can all recognise that now um, there's so much interconnectivity and so much movement. And, and I think actually people who've worked in industry that have moved into academia and vice, vice versa, I think have done a, a lot for that. I think there has been uh, historically a, a perception that... Um, you know, industry, you, you sort of sell yourself to the devil and you take the money. And, and uh, uh, whereas now I think there's much more realisation around um, the need for the, the scale and the, um, the infrastructure of, of industry to translate a, an exciting finding in tar to target to, to man. And also, I think early... Um, insights into terms of developability, I think, is, is important. Equally, I think, from the industry side, um, there have been... Um, when you see something that is not working, um, industry wants to cut that and stop and, and, and uh, move their resource elsewhere. And, and if you've got a postdoc that has been employed to a certain tenure, then that's, that's a, a real problem. So I think there's perhaps some more sort of flexible um, arrangements that could be made in terms of collaboration. I'm scratching the surface because I've got <laughs> a lot to say on that, but happy to, to take that over dinner. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Just to, you know, we've been working, Emma, myself, and various others have been working, trying to increase the numbers of clinical pharmacologists in this country, which not only includes uh, UK NHS, academia, but also in industry as well, and working with ABPI to be able to do that. So just want to understand your perspective of the value of clinical pharmacology in industry, really. <laughs> it's, it's huge, and I think, you know, clinical pharmacology um, goes in, in, in cycles, and I've, I've talked about it in terms of experimental medicine, in terms of translational medicine, it's had lots of iterations, but fundamentally, I think um, whether or not you have clinical pharmacology as a standalone, standalone discipline in industry that is then applied to project teams, 
or you have people with a fundamental understanding of clinical pharmacology and a disease expert. I, I think we've, we've gone too far. Sometimes we've recruited people who have great depth um, uh, and expertise in a particular disease, but without the clinical pharmacology expertise, and, and you, we've flip-flopped. So there is, a, I think, a huge benefit from that. I'm, I'm biased. I started out in a, in a phase one unit, and so although didn't go through an academic clinical pharmacology uh, career, sort of learnt it on, on the job, as it were. And uh, so I think having some kind of uh, hybrid role that allows you to do both, I think, would, would be ideal. So, so do you think there's a role for kind of um, job plans where you can have half funding by uh, industry and half within uh, academia? It's just Oscar does have that kind of role, doesn't he? And, and do you think that we should be trying to develop more of those in the future? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ed Bullmore, um, similarly, um, although that was when he was at, uh, you know, at a professorial level, so perhaps much later in the career, but I think if you could do that in a more um, earlier stage of the career, that, I think that could be really exciting. I should, I should mention, actually, we did try and do that. With the Imaging Centre, we, uh, we had F2 um, physicians um, join that, um, and I recall that um, the modernising medical careers was, was uh, just um, emerging at that stage, and so we, we did manage to have a rotation in the Clinical Imaging Centre um, uh, with, with it, um, Hammersmith, uh, and that was, that was very successful and very popular. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Pauline.